So, um, Lexington's unique, okay? On the day that I burn, I make about 17 phone calls. I have four different fire departments I notify, three different sheriff's departments, um, and uh, I have about, oh, 10 people on a health list. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Even though the Wildlife Department has some of the best wildlife habitat managers in the country, we realize that Oklahoma is more than 95% privately owned. So that's why we regularly partner with other agencies to host landowner workshops to teach the skills and habits of effective wildlife management to private landowners. Today, these landowners are learning about the benefits of prescribed fire and how to properly conduct one on their property. A wildlife department that prioritizes helping landowners be the best habitat managers they can be. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. We're out here at Call Lake today. We're sampling for blue catfish. Uh, we do this every couple of years to monitor population growth and make sure that, that people are able to still have satisfying blue catfish in here at Call Lake, one of the best uh, blue cat fisheries in Oklahoma. Lots of fish, some shad, and a bunch of blue cat. If I had to make that professional decision, I would say they're blue cat. We can't be sure. They could be gar, but I think they're blue cat. Oh, uh, all in front of you, man. Still out right there, some bigger ones. To your right. Jeez. Jeez. Freaking nuts. God. Dude. Ah, okay. No. Yeah. Fisheries work gets tough. A lot of times you set a net and you don't catch very many at all. And then sometimes you set a net and, and there's so many fish that they fill every spot. That's the same thing with shocking. You get a guy with a net and 150 come up. You're only going to get as many as the, the, the guy can catch. So. That's good to see. We started out early this morning, went out and uh, started pulling up some really good fish. Had uh, quite a few quite a few sites that we've had good success and, and continued. We brought them back here at the workup area where we take length, weight, and we collect otoliths for age data. That'll help us determine growth of the population over time. And we can make sure that the fish are growing at a good rate so that anglers are satisfied by the size of of the fish that they catch. Six oh four, twenty four seventy. Four fourteen. All right. 
So this is an outer lift. <laughs> That's how we age fish. We'll mount that in epoxy, section it. Look at it underneath the microscope and count the rings, just like you would tree rings. Blue cat electrofishing is different than normal electrofishing. These fish can come up hundreds of yards away from our actual shock boat. So in order to be able to sample these effectively, we have multiple chase boats running around catching these fish. Um, the actual electrofishing boat cannot go very fast or else the electricity does breaks it and we end up losing fish. But with this chaos going on, we have to make sure that safety is, is a foremost important, that boats don't collide. People are yelling, shouting, pointing where fish are because as soon as one comes up, you want to be sure to get it before he ends up going down. We've been monitoring uh, Caw Lake's catfish population for a few decades now since the lake's been impounded. In recent years, we started looking at evaluating our one over 30 inch length limit that we had. We had some initial research that was conducted in 2017 and 2018 that we've released, wanting to continue looking at that to see if it changes. Since these are long lived fish, it takes a long time to be able to see changes since some of these fish can be over 30 years. Monitoring these blue catfish, we are able to better determine if regulations that we have in place are being effective, and if not, do we need to adjust and make them where they're more effective? Currently, blue catfish regulations are really trying to target at having as many fish over 30 inches stay in the population so that more anglers have opportunity to catch those. That's the one fish over 30 inches a day. If we see deviations where we're not getting those fish up there, we may have to adjust a little bit so that we are meeting the goals of the anglers and uh, the fish biologists that are uh, representing them. Currently, everything's looking just fine. It's still early on since it's been only, you know, just over 10 years since we made this. Again, these fish are long lived. It takes long periods of time to see changes. But right now, we are not seeing anything that suggests that we need to make any difference. Um, we still have a lot of fish. There's a lot of opportunity with our 15 fish bag limit for blue catfish and channel catfish combined. There's still a lot of opportunity to catch a lot of fish under 30 inches each day. And if you do have that awesome fish over 30 inches, you're able to keep one a day too. North America's largest shorebird, the long-billed curlew, migrates through Oklahoma every spring and summer by way of the Central Flyway. This flyway is not only a corridor for migratory birds, but it also connects conservation groups and agencies. That means that research done in North Dakota on nesting curlews can shed light on how the birds utilize Oklahoma's airspace and habitat. When we come back from this video, we will talk to Mark Howery to learn more about the species of greatest conservation need in Oklahoma. The North Dakota Game and Fish Department has teamed with two leading conservation organizations to study the movements of a conspicuous shorebird to better recognize the bird's habitat use in southwestern North Dakota and elsewhere. We're here looking for long-billed curlews, the largest shorebird in North America, um, hoping to be able to find some nests and then therefore be able to trap adult birds and ideally outfit them with satellite or cellular transmitters that can give us data remotely. Biologists deployed five transmitters on long-billed curlews in North Dakota. The North Dakota Game and Fish Department is providing funding for this project, both through our State Wildlife Grants program, but also our non-game fund, uh, the Watchable Wildlife Tax Checkoff monies. Curlews are easily recognized by their size and their long curved bill. About the size of a, a sharp tail, but on stilts, and with that, that scythe-like bill that is really uh, well known, people recognize that quite a bit. Long-billed curlews are on the North Dakota Species of Conservation Priority list because their population has declined. They're also seen as an indicator species for the health of grasslands, um, but even agricultural lands. Um, and so mainly it's because of this population decline that has happened disproportionately in different areas that there's been interest in understanding more about the full annual cycle of long-billed curlews and ideally stitching together what are some limiting factors, what, what are some threats that affect populations and is that affecting different populations differently. Data collected will provide valuable information on habitats these birds are using. Long-billed curlews are only here for a couple months and then they migrate and then they're on the Texas coast or coastal states for, you know, seven, eight, nine months. So it's really important to learn more about, you know, are we all doing our part to make sure that this bird has safe places all along the way? 
This is Mike Anderson in the North Dakota Outdoors. So Mark, we, we learned all about this North Dakota project, but can you help us kind of understand the connection between North Dakota and Oklahoma for, for this? Okay, well, uh, Oklahoma and North Dakota share the same population of long curlews. There's about okay. 85,000 birds in the population. North Dakota is the north end of the nesting range. We're the south end of the nesting range. Okay. There's a few birds that nest on the west side of the Rocky Mountains, and those birds go to the Pacific Coast. But our birds are central flyway birds that uh, spend the summer in the high plains. Okay. Uh, and then in the wintertime, some of the birds go to the grasslands in northern Mexico. Uh, other birds go to the Gulf Coast from Texas all the way to Florida. And that's what we saw with, with these tagged birds from North Dakota, right? Yes, that was one of the fascinating things about this is that you can follow those, those pathways and you can see that some birds are coming through the main body of Oklahoma to get to the Gulf Coast. Other birds are going through the Oklahoma Panhandle and those are going down to Mexico wow. for the winter. Uh, here in Oklahoma, we only have 100 to 150 pairs of long billed curlews, so they're very rare in our state. Uh, we only have them nesting in the western half of the Panhandle in the short grass prairie region Sometimes they'll nest in winter wheat fields as well. Okay. Uh, but we have only a narrow window of time to see them. And that's another cool thing from this North Dakota study is that these birds are moving south much earlier than we expect them to because they're, as you mentioned, they're moving south in June. Wow. And a lot of our birds are still nesting. Uh, so so they're, they're coming in to Oklahoma at the beginning, or the, the beginning of April. Uh, and in three months' time, they're moving back south. That's, that's pretty incredible to, to even think about. And, and these birds that, that came in from North Dakota, they crossed Oklahoma and they didn't even stop in the state, right? So it was a complete flight o across the state. Yeah, that's one of the incredible things about it. And we're learning more and more with this kind of technology about the flights that shorebirds are making. There's a lot of birds that make these incredible flights where they just fly two or three days nonstop from the Gulf of Mexico to the middle of Nebraska or the northern part of North Dakota. Wow. It's, a, it's a pretty amazing that we can get all of this information from, from one study um, up in North Dakota. Yeah, it is. It is very incredible. And it, and it helps us because it's such a rare bird here. And it's, and it's in a remote part of our state. It's difficult to study. So we can get some insights into our birds by seeing what, what's happening in North Dakota. Great. Well, thank you, Mark. Oh, well, thank you. If you see a long-billed curlew or other migratory bird species, feel free to snap a picture and share it on social apps like iNaturalist or eBird, or you can also share it at wildlifedepartment.com. unique thing about these little prairie streams is nobody knows much about them or understands that they're here but these are these are nice clear water creeks with good fishing lots of wildlife and beautiful scenery uh, people forget that uh, we have so much water up here on the prairie you don't uh, catch any smallmouth up here do you no but uh, we catch a lot of spotted bass that it's a I think that uh, kind of the prairie's uh, smallmouth bass they're a lot of fun and it's kind of the same habitat, catch them in the riffles and around the rocks. They fight hard and they jump good and they're a lot of fun to catch on ultralight.
One of the best trips I had up here, though, was in the, well, it was the first time you brought me up here. It was in the middle of the hot summer, about the middle of July. And we came up here a couple of miles above this and waded those holes out by that next low water bridge. Yeah, that's right. You caught a real nice uh, Kentucky on that trip. Yeah. I'd forgotten about that fish. That, uh... We caught a lot of fish that day. Yeah. I mean, you know, they weren't all very big, but just sheer numbers. It seemed like every time you threw, you got a bite. The uh, people, these streams being the, the physical nature of them, being intermittent and so forth, you can put your tennis shoes on in the summertime and, and uh, go looking for the pools. And in the wintertime, it's a nice float. There's quite a bit of water after the, usually in the, from November on, even sometimes up into uh, the middle of May, you can get a nice float and uh, and fish that way. Or when it warms up, put on your tennis shoes and get out and and wade from pool to pool. But it's nice country. What's amazing is the amount of wildlife. You know, these prairie streams. You got a little strip of uh, timber. It serves a habitat along either side, but. On these floats, everybody who's come up here and floated has been amazed at the amount of wildlife. You see deer and coyotes, lots of owls. These these creek bottoms up here in the prairie are just, I don't know, they have, it seems like there's all sorts of animals in them. It's, yeah, these, these streams just kind of serve as a magnet and pull the wildlife right down to them. And a canoe is a great way to see wildlife. True. You can get in it and kind of ease along and be real quiet and see a lot of things that you wouldn't see before. And, and this is nice country and then it's just not covered up with people. You can get some good hunting up here, I guess, out of a canoe, squirrel hunting or even deer hunting. Yeah. Floating these creeks you, uh, in the canoe. Get in the canoe and, and kind of glide along just like we're doing fishing. And uh, it. Uh, That's more like it. Yeah, that's what well, he spotted up nice. Pretty fish, aren't they? Mm-hmm. I do like the way they fly. Good one. There we go. Yeah. A good fish. Nice fish. <laughs> Holy mom. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> oh. He's still full of it. Is that a good fish or what? On a little bitty old beetle spin under that big log, though. <laughs> just like in the movie. Yeah, it yeah, came out like a lion. Just like in the magazines, right under the old big log laying on the bank. Just where the river guide would put you. You want a picture of that fish before we turn him loose, Gary? Oh, well, I'll have to dig all that stuff out. We'll come back and catch him again. Bob. There are some pretty good Kentuckys in That's this creek. That's a nice spot, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, he's healthy looking. Look at the bright color, good markings. I didn't know if I was going to get him in on that light <laughs> line around that big old log. You want to keep him? Let's turn oh, him loose. No, we'll turn him back here. We'll come back here and get him, we'll get him again. We'll get him again. All right. Nice fish. Goodbye, fish. Go into there and uh, get fatter. I should have taken a picture of it myself. Ah, oh, that's what it's all about. Yeah. At least the. You're not a bad guy, Gary. I know it. I'm getting better at this stuff because I hope I, if I last another 80 years, or maybe I'll be good at it. <laughs> Boy, that's fun. Good fish in the white pack. I am so thankful for the Wildlife Department's hunter education classes. Going through a hunter education course is a great first step in becoming a hunter. And it's free, so you can't beat that. Hunter Education gave me information I needed to be safe in the field while hunting. The class also helped me pass on the tradition of hunting to my own kids. And these memories in the field will last forever. And uh, we try to stay consistent. Um, we have actually burnt every piece of this property in the last three years. Well, we hope today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is the perfect place to explore. So however you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember, your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. That work? Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma.